it's not really possible to uh, give a biography of Bunyan without giving a little bit of a historical background first and so that's what I intend to do. As far back as the mid 16th century there were many godly men and women Puritans as they were nicknamed who believed that the national church had retained too much pre-reformation Catholicism in its structure and liturgy and ministry and they could not with a clear conscience subscribe to its ordinances. They believed the church needed further purifying. By the 17th century the Puritans had come to be viewed with deep suspicion and Queen Elizabeth's harsh laws made life intolerable for those ministers who would not conform. More and more were forced to leave the established church for the sake of their conscience. Over a period of time, these separating non-conformists formed the English Presbyterian, Congregational, Baptist and Quaker denominations. But a significant number still remained loyal to the state church, hoping to reform it from within. The Puritans have been and still are in some quarters the most maligned and misrepresented of men. The very word Puritan has become a term of scorn, implying a gloomy fanaticism, a narrow-minded bigotry, a blight on all that is free and joyous. Nothing is further from the actual truth. In fact, the Puritans were a body of godly men who brought a spiritual light to England and drew the nation back to moral values and stamped a moral greatness upon her that no other group, religious or secular, has ever done. But a colossal storm was brewing. The Puritans by their actions and teaching had bitter opponents in the monarchy, parliament and the established church. The political authorities fanned by the church hierarchy were conspiring to silence these nonconformists. By mid-1662 the storm broke. An old parliamentary act was resurrected and reconstituted. This was the infamous act of uniformity. The act required that all ministers in the Church of England give unfeigned assent and consent to everything contained in the Book of Common Prayer and reordination for those not already ordained by a bishop. Every pastor was given an ultimatum requiring him to conform or else be expelled from his church. And the deadline was the 24th of August 1662. And so on that fateful day, Black Bartholomew's Day, more than 2,000 British ministers were ejected from their churches for refusing to comply. And by this one decree, the vast majority of England's evangelical preachers were officially silenced. However, the ejected men continued to preach and teach, meeting with their congregations in homes and barns or wherever worship could be conducted and the word of God expounded. And so this gave rise to the passing by Parliament two years later of the Conventicle Act. It forbade and made illegal the gathering in a house for worship of more than five people additional to the family. And so the Conventicle Act forced the congregations into the countryside. And they met deep in the woods and began gathering during the night to worship and pray. To counter this, the Parliament passed and the King ratified the Five Mile Act. This act forbade and made illegal any religious meetings held by nonconformist ministers within five miles of any town or village. And most poor people didn't even own a horse, so there was no way of getting there. Breach of these acts could be punishable by a fine, imprisonment, deportation, or even death. It was also possible that all one's belongings could be confiscated. And although these laws could not be strictly enforced, they nevertheless led to appalling persecution and suffering among the dissenters. Now it's impossible to understand these events unless it is recognised that to the Puritans a clear conscience was at the heart of true Christianity. See, to them there could be no real spiritual understanding nor any genuine godliness except as men exposed and enslaved their consciences to God's word. The healthy Christian is not necessarily the extrovert, ebullient Christian 
But the Christian who has a sense of God's presence stamped deep on his soul, who trembles at God's word, who lets it dwell in him richly by constant meditation upon it, and who tests and reforms his life daily in response to it. And it was this clarity and purity of conscience that was the means by which the Puritans understood a preacher to have power in their ministry to others. If the word does not dwell with, us, with power in us, it will not pass with power from us. And one of those caught up in these terrible events of the mid-1600s and who refused to compromise his conscience in the light of scripture was a tinker preacher named John Bunyan. Bunyan was born in the lace-making town of Elstow in late 1628. He came from a relatively poor family and had a meagre schooling. By the time he was nine or ten, he was living a profligate life. He wrote, I had but few equals for cursing and swearing, lying and blaspheming the holy name of God. I became so settled and rooted in these things that they became a sort of second nature to me. However, Bunyan had heard many a Puritan sermon and his conscience gave him no rest. He was greatly troubled by thoughts of God's judgment and of his danger of ending up in hell. Yet he could not let go of his sins. At 16, Bunyan went into the army, but after serving only three years, was discharged. Having left home a boy, he returned to Elstow a man, and he now set about finding himself a wife. He married when he was 21, but he and his wife Mary lived in extreme poverty, not having even as much as a dish or a spoon or any other household item between the two of them. And in due time, Mary gave birth to their first child, a daughter whom they also named Mary. It was not long before they discovered that she was blind. Mary's father, an Anglican Puritan, had given her two books prior to his death, The Plain Man's Pathway to Heaven and The Practice of Piety. An occasional reading of these two volumes caused Bunyan to think more on the things of God and he later acknowledged, these books did beget within me some desire after religion. He started going to church on Sundays, morning and evening. He made every effort to show that he was a devout man and he joined heartily in the worship, the prayers and the singing. But secretly he clung to his ungodly ways during the rest of the week. One Sunday, Bunyan heard a sermon about the Sabbath. He was conscience-stricken, and for the first time since he was nine or ten, experienced a deep sense of guilt. I went home when the sermon was ended with a great burden on my spirit. By the time lunch was over, all was forgotten, and he was back into his usual Sunday afternoon sport. In the middle of the game, he suddenly heard a voice, as if from heaven itself. Will you leave your sins and go to heaven, or keep your sins and go to hell? Surely God was threatening him with some terrible punishment for his ungodly life. He decided there and then that it was probably too late to think about heaven. My state is surely miserable. Miserable if I leave my sins, but miserable if I follow them. I can but be damned. And if I must be so, I had as good be damned for many sins as to be damned for few. <laughs> and so I made as much haste as I could to fill my belly with its delicacies, lest I should die before I had my desires. For that was a thing that I greatly feared, because I wanted them with all my heart. One day he was standing at a shop window swearing and cursing in his usual way when the owner's wife suddenly rebuked him, declaring that he was the ungodliest fellow for swearing she'd ever heard. Bunyan was silenced by this sudden and unexpected reprimand. He felt ashamed and from that moment stopped swearing. No one was more surprised at this turn of events than Bunyan himself because he soon discovered that he could actually speak better and more pleasantly without swearing. <laughs> So he dusted down his Bible and began reading it once more. For more than a year, he persisted with a rigorous outward reformation in both speech and conduct. He was determined to keep the Ten Commandments as the way of getting to heaven, and for the most part believed he was managing reasonably well. He began to feel quite proud of his spiritual progress and was convinced that he pleased God as well as any man in England. His neighbours were amazed at his transformation. They praised him and spoke well of him. 
a fact which gratified Bunyan no end. He later wrote, how pleased I was when I heard them say these things about me, for although I was still nothing but a poor painted hypocrite, I loved to be talked about as one who was truly godly. I was proud of my godliness, and indeed I did everything I could to be well spoken of. One day in Bedford, he came upon three or four poor women sitting in a doorway talking about the things of God. Since he now considered himself a brisk talker in religion, he moved a little closer in order to hear their conversation more clearly. To his amazement, he discovered that their discussion was way over his head. They were talking about how they were sure they had been born as helpless sinners, of how God had done a work of grace in their hearts, and how they had been born again. Their conversation left Bunyan speechless. He began to tremble at the realisation of the insignificance of his own religious life. He suddenly saw that in all his thoughts about religion and salvation, he had never once considered his need of this new birth. Nor had he ever considered the treachery and deceitfulness of his own heart in the way these poor women had been talking about theirs. Nor had he taken any notice of his secret, evil thoughts, of his ungodly inner motives, of his unworthy desires and habits. I was greatly affected with their words, both because by them I was convinced that I was in want of the true tokens of a truly godly man, and also because by them I was convinced of the happy and blessed condition of him that was such a one. He returned often to sit and listen to their conversations about the things of God, but by comparison with the biblical understanding which these ladies in Bedford had, he very soon came to the conclusion that he was nothing but an ignorant sot. It was not long before Bunyan could see that those who have no faith have no hope. But how could he tell whether he had faith or not? Well, the devil very quickly convinced the ignorant Bunyan that if he had faith, then he should be able to do a miracle here and there. That would prove the point. So on one of his treks between Elstow and Bedford, the idea came into his mind that he should try commanding the puddles on the road to dry up and the dry spots to become puddles. And he was about to make his test when it occurred to him that it would be a very good idea to pray first. <laughs> then the thought came, what if I prayed and then tried and nothing happened? It would be very clear that I had no faith, it would be forever lost. So he decided not to force the issue and defer the test for a later date. <laughs> but the devil did not give up that easily and would whisper in Bunyan's ear, it is ordinary for those that have professed themselves God's servants after a while to give him the slip and return to me. But do thou, do thou likewise, all shall be well. Bunyan was deeply distressed as to whether or not he was among God's elect. You probably aren't, said a voice. But maybe that I am. Well, said the voice, you may as well forget it. If you're not chosen of God, then there's no hope of you being saved, for it's not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God who shows mercy. And Bunyan became convinced that those in Bedford that were already converted were all that God was going to save in those parts. And obviously, he had missed out. He went on in this agony for months. Slowly, he began to recognise certain sins and evil thoughts that he'd never noticed before. He felt he was growing worse and worse and further than ever away from conversion. He was terribly discouraged. His incessant self-examination and self-condemnation led him further and further into the slow of despond. Bunyan nevertheless came to the conclusion that if he was lost and did not have life, it was entirely because of his sin. Bunyan knew the scriptures well enough to understand very clearly that he needed a perfect righteousness with which to be presented without fault before God, and that this righteousness could only be found in the person of Jesus Christ. But, he wrote, my original and inward pollution, that, that was my plague and my affliction. I was more loathsome in my eyes than was a toad, and I thought I was so in God's eyes too. Sin and corruption, I said, would as naturally bubble out of my heart as water would bubble out of a fountain. 
In spite of the despair which now engulfed Bunyan, he was still thinking through everything with remarkable bursts of insight. What really frightened him was the fact that he'd seen people come under what he called the wounds of conscience, but who, as soon as this guilt passed and they had relief, cared little how that peace of heart had been obtained. And though I was thus troubled and tossed and afflicted with the sight and sense of terror and terror of my wickedness, yet I was afraid to let this sight and sense go quite off my mind. For I found that unless guilt of conscience was taken off in the right way, that is, by the blood of Christ, a man grows rather worse for the loss of his troubled mind than better. Lord, do not let this sense of guiltiness go away except it be through the blood of Christ and the application of your mercy through him to my soul. When Bunyan was 25, a Mr Gifford, the nonconformist rector of St John's in Bedford, took an interest in him and invited him to his home. His sound biblical teaching was exactly what Bunyan needed. Bunyan's turmoil was familiar to Gifford because he'd been through it all himself. Step by step, he led Bunyan into a right understanding of the gospel. Gifford's faithful ministry drove Bunyan to a more careful search of the scriptures. He began to read biographies of the lives of some of the great saints. He started reading commentaries such as Martin Luther's on Galatians, a work which he found most fit for a wounded conscience. Shortly after, Bunyan was baptized in the River Ouse. The simple ceremony with his pastor and friends took place in the dead of night so as to avoid the inevitable backlash which such pro public professions of faith attracted in those troubled times. But following his baptism, Bunyan entered what he called the Great Storm. All his comforts disappeared, and a terrible darkness descended on him. Floods of blasphemies against God and Christ poured over him. He sank into a very deep despair, wishing that somehow he could exchange his life for that of a dog or a horse. For a year, the storm continued. In agony, he would cry out for help. But in the midst of his distress, the tempter would whisper in his ear, You're very anxious for mercy, but I'll cool you off. This frame of mind will not last forever, you know. Many others have been as warm-hearted as you are, but I've quenched their zeal. I'll cool you off little by little, so that you'll scarcely notice it. What do I care, though it takes seven years to chill your heart if I can do it at last. I'll play it carefully, and I'll have my end at last. Though you be full of zeal at present, I can pull you from the fire. I'll have you cold before very long. These long periods of testing place Bunyan under colossal strain. But in spite of these awful times of doubt and anguish, the Lord would often speak to Bunyan during his fiery trials. And on one occasion, it was as if he was saying to him, I loved you while you were committing this sin. I loved you before. I love you still. And I love you forever. One day he was suddenly impressed by the words, Thy righteousness is in heaven. In a moment he saw that his righteousness was in Christ, who was now at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He saw in a flash that no matter what he was or what he was doing at the time, he was not without righteousness. I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself. Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions and irons. My temptations also fled away. Now went I also home rejoicing for the love and grace of God. There was nothing but Christ that was before my eyes. I saw my gold was in my trunk at home. And now I saw Christ Jesus was looked on of God and should also be looked upon by us as that common or public person in whom all the body of his elect are always to be considered and reckoned, that we fulfill the law by him, rose from the dead by him, got the victory over sin and death and the devil and hell by him. When he died, we died. 
and so of his resurrection. I had such an amazing understanding of the divine grace of God that I could hardly bear up under it. But once again, doubts came flooding back. His past sins began to haunt him yet again. And as he was walking in the house in a most depressed state of mind one day, God took hold of him and pressed upon him the words of Romans 3.24. You are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Oh, what a turn this made upon me. Oh, what a sudden change it made. It was as though I had awakened out of a nightmare. Now God seemed to be saying to me, Sinner, you cannot think that I cannot save you. Sinner, you think that I cannot save your soul because of your sin. Behold, my son is here. And I look upon him, not on you. And I shall deal with you according as I'm pleased with him. And by this I was made to understand that God can justify a sinner at any time by looking upon Christ and imputing his benefits to him. And so for the first time in his life, the great burden Pilgrim had carried rolled off his shoulders last Bunyan had been truly released he was now growing and maturing in his understanding of the things of the Lord he poured over the scriptures and read widely in the writings of the great men of the past one day his Christian friends asked him to speak a word of exhortation to them in one of their meetings Bunyan declined but they kept at it finally he consented and with feelings of much weakness and inadequacy spoke twice to a small group of believers and so it was he tested his gift among them. It seemed as I spoke that they were being given a blessing. Afterwards many told me in the sight of the great God that they were helped and comforted. And so it was in this quiet way that Bunyan felt the call of God to the ministry of preaching and teaching the word. In 1655 Bunyan moved his house and family to Bedford. Within two years, the church in Bedford confirmed his sense of calling and after much prayer and fasting, appointed him as a deacon to the public ministry of the word as a non-conformist preacher. Bunyan now began to feel a great desire to preach to the unconverted and he could not rest unless he was out exercising the gifts God had given him. Though trembling, I used my gift to preach the blessed gospel in proportion to my faith as God has showed me in the holy word of truth. And when the word got around that I was doing this, people came in by the hundreds from all over to hear the word preached. Bunyan had a deep concern for the souls of those around him and especially for those to whom he was preaching. He spoke with great earnestness to them about their need to be rescued from sin and Satan and did all in his power to awaken their consciences. At first Bunyan was taken by surprise at people's response to his preaching. He hardly dared think that God would actually use him to bring others to faith. They, in fact, blessed God for me, unworthy wretch though I was, and counted me as God's instrument who showed them the way of salvation. Bunyan's experiences during his years of temptation, sin and turmoil played a large part in the way in which he preached. The terrors of the law and the guilt of his own transgression still lay heavily on his conscience. So he preached what he felt. Strange as it may seem, Bunyan was still caught in his old guilts and retained many of his previous doubts. I can honestly say that many a time as I've gone to preach, I have been full of guilt and terror right up to the pulpit door. And there it has been taken off, and I've been at liberty until my work was done, and then immediately before I could get down the pulpit stairs, it was upon me as bad as before. Gradually a clearer assurance of salvation came to him and in typical Puritan experimental fashion this now began to permeate his preaching. And as soon as some new glimmer of light or understanding came to him from the word Bunyan would preach it into life in his sermons to his regular congregations. He often experienced extraordinary insights as to what lay ahead in his ministry. He noted that when there was a particular work that he was to do for God there would come over his spirit ahead of time a great desire to go and preach at a certain place. The names of specific people would be pressed upon his heart, people he didn't even know, but for whom he cried out for their salvation. 
And these would be the very ones who would come to faith as a result of his ministry when he went to that town. On one occasion he wrote, Sometimes I've noticed that a word cast in, by the way, has done more than all the rest of the sermon. Sometimes when I thought I had done the least, then it developed that the most had been accomplished. And at other times when I thought I'd really gotten hold of them, I found I'd fished for nothing. After preaching, he would always be full of concern that the word might have fallen like rain on stony places. All that those who have heard me speak today will but see as I do what sin and death and hell and the curse of God really are, and that they might understand the grace and love and mercy of God. Bunyan's preachings and writings could not fail to attract criticism and opposition. He was slandered with vicious accusations. He was, it was rumoured that he had a mistress, that he had his whores and several illegitimate children. He said, oh, I have a good conscience, and they shall be ashamed who speak evil of me and falsely accuse my good conversation in Christ. More serious were the growing complaints from parish clergy that Bunyan was not ordained in the Church of England to preach, nor licensed to officiate as an Orthodox minister in the Bedford Church. Bunyan made no reply to these accusations. Nevertheless, he and his people knew that the eye of the law was always on him, carefully watching every move of the itinerant preacher. Not long after he'd moved to Bedford, his much-loved pastor and mentor, John Gifford, died, and within months, Gifford was replaced by a fine young man, John Burton. But since his health was weak, Bunyan often had to stand in for him as the Sunday preacher. The birth of two sons, John and Thomas, occasioned great joy to both John and Mary, but all was not well. His wife's already frail health began to decline rapidly, and before Bunyan was 30, she had passed away. In September 1660, Burton also died, and once again the Bedford people were without a pastor. Worse still, the congregation suddenly lost the use of the building itself. With little warning, an establishment rector was installed at St John's, and the nonconformist congregation not only had to find a new pastor, but also a new meeting place. The congregation now gathered wherever they could, in a barn or someone's stable or perhaps in a cowshed. For Bunyan, these were dark days indeed, especially as he could see far more ominous storm clouds rapidly gathering. He became increasingly concerned for the welfare and safety of his children and determined, for their sake as much as for his own, that he must marry again. And this he did in 1660, just as the storm was about to break. In 1658, Oliver Cromwell had died, and shortly after his son Richard resigned. This was the prelude to the awful events of 1660 when the Long Parliament was dissolved. In May, Charles II arrived in London heralding the beginning of the restoration of the monarchy and the Episcopal Church as it had been prior to the Civil War. With this sudden change came the determination on the part of the establishment to be rid of the Puritans once and for all. In Bedfordshire County, the magistrate lost no time in sending out a decree for the public reading of the liturgy of the Church of England. Bunyan soon discovered that he was being shadowed wherever he went, but he could not and would not bow to the demands of the establishment church. On November the 12th in 1660, Bunyan made his way to a small farmhouse about 20 kilometres south of Bedford, there to fulfil a regular preaching engagement. His friends were apprehensive and feared for his safety, questioning his wisdom in going ahead with the meeting. I will not stir, neither will I have the meeting dismissed. Come, be of good cheer, let us not be daunted. Our cause is good, we need not be ashamed of it. To preach God's word is so good a work that we will be well rewarded if we suffer for that. Bunyan had hardly begun his sermon when the doors were flung open and a constable, one of the magistrate's servants, marched into the meeting issuing a warrant for his arrest. Brethren and sisters, said Bunyan, we are prevented of our opportunity to speak and hear the word of God and we are like to suffer for this attempt to do so. But I do desire that you shall not be discouraged. It is mercy, it is a mercy, I say, to suffer upon so good an account. We suffer as Christians for well-doing, and we had better be persecuted than the persecutors. Well, Bunyan never finished his exhortation. 
but was hauled out of the meeting and marched off to the magistrate's house, there to be committed to Bedford jail until his hearing before the justice of Elstow a week later. He was charged with going about to several conventicles in the country to the great disparagement of the Church of England. Seven weeks later, in January 1661, he appeared before the county court of sessions in Bedford. John Bunyan, labourer, hath devilishly and perniciously abstained from coming to church to hear divine service and as a common upholder of several unlawful meetings and conventicles to the great hindrance and distraction of the good subjects of this kingdom. What say you to this? John replied, I am a common frequenter of the church of God and I am also by grace a member with those people over whom Christ is the head. But do you come to church? You know what I mean, the parish church to hear divine service. No, answered John, I do not. Why not? Because I do not find it commanded in the word of God. We are commanded to pray, but not by the common book of prayer. How then? With the spirit. As with the apostle says, I will pray with the spirit and with the understanding. We may pray with the spirit and with understanding and with the common prayer book also. A long debate then followed between Bunyan and the magistrate. In the end he was indicted as one who had encouraged unlawful assemblies and had not conformed to the national worship of the Church of England. Bunyan replied on his own behalf. He truly admitted that he had been preaching the word of God and that yes, he had been holding meetings in both town and countryside and no, he would not subscribe to the prayer book of the Church of England. Bunyan stood as the sentence was declared. Hear your judgment. You must be had back again to prison and there lie for three months following. And at three months end, if you do not submit to go to, the church, to church to hear divine service and leave your preaching, you must be banished the realm. And if after such a day as shall be appointed for you to be gone and you shall be found in this realm or be found to come over again without special leave from the king, you must stretch by the neck for it. I tell you plainly, Take him away. Bunyan's reply was simple and to the point. Sir, if I'm out of prison today, I will preach the gospel again tomorrow by the grace of God. Bunyan's trial and imprisonment were in fact illegal. He was in custody purely as a result of the malice and prejudice of the magistrate and Bunyan's other detractors. Thus he returned to his tiny cell in Bedford jail. Later he wrote... I can truly say I bless the Lord Jesus Christ for it that my heart was sweetly refreshed in the time of my examination and also afterwards at my returning to the prison. True though that was, he was deeply grieving on another account. His young wife Elizabeth had been under great strain from her husband's arrest and conviction. She had just given birth to her first child but sadly it was stillborn. And Bunyan wrote from jail, in this condition I have found much contentment through grace. Though there have been many turnings and goings upon my heart from the Lord, from Satan and from my own corruption. But after all these things, glory be to Jesus Christ, I have also received much instruction and understanding. I have never in all my life had so much of the word of God open up so plainly to me before. Those scriptures that I saw nothing particularly in before have been made in this place to shine upon me. Also, Jesus Christ was never more real to me than now. Here, I have seen and felt him indeed. However, what did lie heavily upon Bunyan's heart was his wife Elizabeth and the children. They had no means of support, no one to protect them. His concern for them caused him great anguish. Off his heart, often his heart would almost break at the thought of his blind daughter's difficulties without him by her side. She would most likely have to beg to help support his very poor family. He was tortured with visions of her being beaten or suffering cold, hunger, nakedness and a thousand other calamities. And he wrote to them, I must venture you all with God, though it cuts to the heart to leave you. And he went on, I must suffer properly 
I must first pass the sentence of death upon everything that can be in this life, even to reckon myself, my wife, my children, my health, my enjoyments, and all as dead to me, and myself as dead to them. The way not to faint is to look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, things which are not seen are eternal. He realized that if he could venture all for God, then he would be hiring God to take care of all his concerns. And so he came to see that his family would not be nearly so safe under his own care than under God's if they were left trustingly at his feet. One lurking fear that worried Bunyan for a time was the prospect of being banished, deported to some foreign country. A more realistic prospect was that he would go to the gallows. This fear was countered by his determination that he would not mount the steps to be seen to die with a pale face and tottering knees. No, he would pray that God would comfort him and give him strength for whatever dark circumstances awaited him. Meantime, Bunyan's young wife, Elizabeth, had not been idle. She began petitioning the judges at every opportunity. She even went to London, to the House of Lords, no less, in an attempt to secure her husband's release. She made several presentations to the judge who had condemned Bunyan, an extraordinarily courageous move in those days for a woman to undertake. And on one occasion, her passionate and womanly logic clearly rattled the outraged judge. My Lord, I make bold to come once again to your Lordship to know what may be done with my poor husband. He is kept unlawfully in prison. They clapped him up before any proclamation was made against the meetings, and the indictment also is false. He was lawfully convicted, retorted the judge. It is false, it is false, protested Elizabeth. What? You think that we can do as we please? Your husband is a breaker of the peace and is convicted by the law. My lord, he was not. He was not lawfully convicted. He was lawfully convicted. It's false, she said. It was but a word of discourse that they took for a conviction. But woman, it is recorded. It's recorded. Then, my lord, you give me neither releasement nor relief. I have four small children that cannot help themselves, of which one is blind, and we have nothing to live upon but the charity of good people. Is not your husband a tinker? questioned the judge. Is he better off running up and down a preaching than by following his trade? My lord, it is because my husband is a tinker and a poor man that he is despised and cannot have justice. Elizabeth's importunity finally seemed to win a concession from the judge and there was a faint though brief glimmer of compassion from his lordship. I tell thee, woman, seeing it is so, that they have taken what thy husband spoke for a conviction. Thou must either apply thyself to the king or sue out of his pardon or get a writ of error. But a writ of error will be the cheapest. I'm sorry, woman, I can do thee no good. Two years after he was jailed, the infamous act of uniformity was passed. And so 2,000 pastors were ejected from their churches for refusing to conform. Moses continued to preach, and it was not long before the terrible persecutions and arrests commenced. Bunyan suddenly had at least 30 or 40 other dissenting ministers for company within the walls of the crowded county jail. The years passed, and Bunyan occupied his time in prayer and meditation on the scriptures. Of course, his pen was never idle, and he spent many hours a day in writing. Little did he realize that he was going to reach more people through his popular writings than he could ever have done by his voice. And his writings and his publications went through edition after edition after edition during his lifetime. And the moment they were printed, they would be purchased and sold out. Meantime, his wife and friends never let up in petitioning and pleading for him to be discharged, even though such support for the prisoner was a risky business for each one of them. They knew, as did Bunyan, that if his release was not obtained, he would certainly die a premature death from the appalling conditions in Bedford Jail. Eventually, after six years, Bunyan was suddenly set free. Soon as possibly gathered his folk together, even though the law was still being enforced against such meetings. He soon discovered that the political climate had not really changed and men were still being thrown into prison for preaching illegally. However, Bunyan took full advantage of the political lull and recommenced preaching. The people came from far and wide, finding a wonderful consolation in his discourses and admonitions. <laughs> 
He also began itinerant preaching tours, reaching some of the remotest parts of the countryside in order that others might hear the word. Nevertheless, Bunyan moved with caution and holy fear, earnestly praying that the impending difficulties which he saw hanging over the heads of the nation for their sins would be somehow abated. Bunyan's freedom was short-lived. One day he was holding a meeting in an isolated part of Bedfordshire. As on the previous occasion, the constable entered the assembly and issued a warrant for his arrest. After a brief trial, Bunyan was once again back within the walls of Bedford Jail, but now guarded more strictly than ever. He had been free for only a matter of months. Weeks later, his sadness was compounded by the death of his much-loved blind daughter Mary. She was 16. A cloud now came over him. He seemed to be unable to pray with fervour as before. His pen was silent. He couldn't really think clearly. By December in 1671, his friends in Bedford were looking for a new pastor. And Bunyan, though still in jail, was chosen by them in faith to be their leader. Only three days later, Charles II signed a declaration of religious indulgence virtually guaranteeing the freedom of all dissenting pastors then in prison. And so in January 1672, after having spent a further six years in jail, Bunyan found himself not only at liberty once more, but the pastor of the local dissenting congregation. This faithful group of believers had been through many trials. For 12 years they'd had no regular meeting place and they'd been forced to assemble secretly within doors or at night in the open fields or in secluded woods. Now with a pastor of their own and with a significant change in the political climate, it was time for the congregation to have a permanent meeting place. And so in May of that year, a barn was obtained and duly licensed to be a place for the use of such as do not conform to the Church of England, who are of the persuasion commonly called congregational, to meet and assemble in, in order to their public worship and devotion. The assembly in the barn became known as the Bunyan Meeting, Bunyan himself being officially licensed in May to teach as a congregational person. In March 1675, Bunyan's ministry came to a sudden halt, yet again. The Declaration of Indulgences was suddenly revoked by the king himself and a new test act drawn up. Non-conformists were once again subject to imprisonment. So for a third time, the magistrates issued a warrant for Bunyan's arrest. However, this time the penalty was not prison, but a severe fine. Those who failed to pay would have all their possessions and property confiscated. To Bunyan, this was far more serious than going to jail. His wife and family would not only be penniless, but homeless. And since the warrant had to be served personally, there was no alternative but for Bunyan to go underground. So for 18 months, he was on the run from the authorities. His friends hid him in their homes, sometimes in a chimney or a cupboard and more than once he had to make a hurried exit through the back door into the woods. During this year and a half, Bunyan didn't cease preaching. preaching. Meetings were held at night in remote locations and deep in the forest. But eventually he was caught and escorted back to Bedford Jail. The charge? Refusing to come to church to receive the sacraments. In spite of these events, Bunyan was at peace in the certainty that his Lord was providentially ordering all the circumstances of his life as well as those of his family and congregation. No, he would not complain, but use the time to full advantage in prayer and meditation and of course in doing more writing. And so with this resolve fixed in his mind, he dozed off and began to dream. Well, Bunyan's dream, wherever it may have taken place, was no ordinary dream. It was more like a vision, and he saw in this dream a pilgrim himself making his way from the city of destruction to the celestial city. It was a journey fraught with many perils and hardships. And those of you who have read Pilgrim's Progress will know all the elements of the life of Bunyan that were woven into that amazing allegory. As Bunyan dreamed, it was as if his whole life rolled on before his eyes. He was seeing a full-length portrait of himself. All that he had been through up to that point was woven into the story of his pilgrim. So when he woke, he knew what he had to do, write it down. He must record this vision, this allegory, so that all could see and learn from his dream. And so he began drafting the first part of his now famous Pilgrim's Progress. Progress. 
Well, Bunyan's extraordinary patience moved the Bishop of London to pity his hard and unreasonable sufferings and ordered the Tinker's release in 1677. This had come about largely due to the intervention of Bunyan's London associates, including the Puritan theologian, Dr John Owen, who was a personal friend and admirer of Bunyan. And it was John Owen who told Charles II, I would gladly give up all my learning for that tinker's power of preaching. Once released, Bunyan headed for London to see Owen. From that time onwards, he often ministered in nonconformist churches in the capital, especially to Doc Dr John Owen's congregation. At first, it was thought that since he, he was uneducated, he would have nothing to say worth listening to. But as it happened, large crowds met regularly to hear him, convinced that he was a man of sound judgment who had a deep knowledge of sacred things. The congregations of his very public ministry in London often numbered as many as 3,000. Meantime, Bunyan's pastoral work in Bedfordshire flourished, and for the next 11 years, he never lacked for crowded congregations flocking to hear him. When he was not preaching, he'd be writing, and his next great work was the Holy War, and soon followed the second part of Pilgrim's Progress. Nor did his pen rest. He continued writing right up until his death, producing in his lifetime some 66 books, In 1688, Bunyan was on his way to London to fulfill a preaching engagement when he was suddenly caught in a drenching storm. He arrived exhausted, shivering and soaked through. The next day he was far from well, having passed the night in a feverish restlessness. Nevertheless, he set out on Sunday morning to preach at Whitechapel. After the sermon, Bunyan closed in prayer and descended the pulpit, never to enter one again. He was now in a raging fever and was immediately rushed to bed in the home of one of his London friends. Two days later, the symptoms of pneumonia appeared. And although Bunyan was not an old man, he was now fighting for his life. For 10 days, often in a delirious state, he fought for breath. Then on the morning of August 31, 1688, he said weakly to his friends at his bedside, I desire nothing more than to be with Christ, which is far better. He knew his time had come. Stretching out his arms, he declared, take me for I come to thee. And with those words, Christian waded into the river and crossed over to the, to the celestial city. Bunyan's pilgrim had lasted just 60 years, but now he was home at last. Three days later, Bunyan was buried at Bunhill Fields in London, the funeral being attended by scores of his London Puritan friends. It was two days before the sad news of his death reached Bedford, Elizabeth and the children were devastated. So too were his friends at the Bedford meeting. They immediately gathered, the and, gathered and the records show that Wednesday on September the 4th was kept in prayer and humiliation for this heavy stroke upon us, the death of dear brother Bunyan. There's so much more we could say about Bunyan, but my time's gone. But his writings during that period had an enormous impact on the believers in England. And so one biographer says very simply, Bunyan, hardly less than any other living man, helped to keep the soul of England alive.